Hi, my name is Tony Foster and I'm an alcoholic. Today we're going to talk about steps 6 and 7 out of the book Alcoholics Anonymous and 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. But first, a bit about me. I drank for 30 years. I've been sober now for almost 22 years. In my sober time, I've been through the entire steps uh, probably five times. I've also, as a sponsor, been through the steps probably a hundred times, as well as speaking on them quite a bit in AA meetings, as well as in the treatment uh, environment where I've done uh, step work with our clients. So I have quite a lot of experience with the steps, and I feel like I have a, a nuanced knowledge of the steps from that experience. Okay, so let's get started. If you've been watching this series, you've uh, participated perhaps in steps one through five. And in step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives were unmanageable. In step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. In step three, we turned our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. In step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And in step five, uh, we admit it to God, to ourselves, and another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Now, in step six, we're going to be entirely ready to have God remove those defects of character. And in step seven, we're going to humbly ask him to do so. First, a note of why we're doing steps six and seven together. Some of the steps in, in the 12 steps effortlessly go together. Six and seven is that way. Eight and nine is that way. And 10, 11, and 12 are that way. Some people think that four and five are that way, but I don't think so, because step four is a solitary job. It's something that we have to be introspective about, and we have to do our own inventory and look through our past and see the things we've done and the things that have been done to us. In step five, um, we are telling that story of what we found in step four, and if we have a good sponsor or whomever it is that we're telling it to, they're asking probing, pertinent questions about the story that you're telling them so that you can develop uh, a plan of your defects of character, the exact nature of your wrongs. Those are your defects of character. So if you've worked with me on the previous steps, you know that I like to work both out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. In Steps 6 and 7, I work almost entirely out of the 12 and 12, because the big book only devotes one paragraph to step six and one paragraph to step seven, and it's really skimming it, just really just saying, uh, you know, that we're, we want the shortcomings taken away and that we humbly ask that for that to happen. The 12 and 12 explains it much better. Now, over the years in the rooms, I've heard that the real work happens in steps six and seven. Let's be clear, all the steps are work and they're life-changing, but steps six and seven is where we start to change, where we take those defects of character and we want them to be taken away and then we ask for them to be taken away. So we become willing for them to disappear and then we ask God humbly to take them away. Now, what does, what does willingly mean? Why would we not willingly want our character defects to be taken away? Well, some character defects for people like us who have ego issues, and I want to be perfectly clear that my biggest problem was my ego, and what I see in the rooms and what I see um, when I speak at treatment centers is that uh, almost everybody who is in our position of trying to get sober, their ego is a huge challenge. And so um, if we don't want to be willing to have them taken away because they feed our egos. For example, righteous indignation uh, is an ego feeding thing. Uh, and, and it's not good for people like us. And greed can be looked upon as, as being ambitious as the 12 and 12 tech tells us. Uh, but what it really is, is a way of feeling superior to other people. So we have to be willing to get rid of these character defects. And then we humbly have to ask God to do that in step seven. Now, once you've come to the realization that you are willing to have the character defects taken away, you have to, A, humbly ask to have them taken away, and B, you have to learn how to become humble. 
Now, how does someone become humble? You can't fake your way through it. You can't fake your way through your ego being smashed. I've seen many times that the 12 steps are an ego-smashing proposition. It happens in step 5, it happens in step 9, it happens in step 3, it happens in step 7. It happens over and over again. And the way that we do that at the beginning, perhaps, is through service. We start doing things like making coffee meetings or setting up the chairs, things that we might in the previous times have thought we were too good for. So we have to do things that help other people instead of just ourselves because we've been self-serving long enough. So when I say that you can't fake your way through it, uh, step seven, uh, by acting humble, you're not humble just by acting humble. You're not humble just by saying you're humble. You can't be the person who assesses your humility or, or lack thereof, particularly that you are humble, you know, because by definition, if you think you're humble, you're not. Okay. Other people see you as being humble or, or not. Other people can make that assessment about you. Doing service helps them to see you becoming humble. Now, you can see yourself improving. Now, how does that happen? It happens by doing service. It happens by having more patience and dealing with loved ones. It happens by not acting superior to other people. It happens by just not always trying to be the center of attention. Those are the kinds of things that you can see in yourself um, uh, working to be uh, more humble. Um, how about you can see it if you no longer have to be right in every discussion. In every discussion, you don't always have to top the other person's story. If you just take a step back from the conversation, and be the listener instead of the talker. Remember, with big egos, we're really insecure, and that's why we have to be the center of attention, because we feel we're not getting off of it. And now let's step back from that attention, and let somebody else have the attention. And that's how you start becoming humble. Something that hit me right between the eyes the first time I, I went through the steps was my sponsor saying to me, Tony, would you rather be right, or would you rather be happy? And being that it was early in sobriety, I thought being right meant being happy. But the more we talked about it, the more I realized that it's not the same thing. And I'd rather be happy. So sometimes I can let the other person be right. It's okay. I don't have to win every argument. So that is a way that we can show that we're becoming a little bit more humble. And people will notice it in you. Because if you were anything like me, it will be a stark change from the way we were. I remember somebody saying to me, who are you? You're not the Tony I knew. You would argue every point. And my response to that was, of course I would. If I think you're wrong and I'm right, I'm going to argue every point. Well, I don't need to do that anymore. Okay. Now, let's be, let's be candid. My ego is still a problem. I still have to harness it. I still have to watch out for my ego. I still pray and meditate every day in order to help me tone down my ego. I still try to be patient. I consciously try to be patient. And I try to do service for others, even almost 22 years in. So um, again, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? I'd rather be happy. Another thing I learned through the process is my behavior. Looking at my behavior coldly and saying, how does my behavior help me? If all it does is blow me up and blow my ego up and make me feel superior, is that really helping me when I'm alienating somebody else doing it? How does it help me get to the goal I want? And so I started looking at that. I started thinking first before I spoke and start thinking, how is this going to help me if I go down this path? And so that that has now become my mantra over 21 and a half years, is whenever I'm in any form of conflict, I think to myself, how is this going to help me? How is this 
path or this argument or me getting upset or me losing my patience, how are any of those things going to help me? How's that going to get me to my final goal? I've found that this process needs to be intentional. Okay? The process of asking myself, how does this help me? So that's step six and seven, and this is a relatively short video, uh, because um, becoming willing in step six and, and learning about humility in step seven are both very important, and both things that we have to continue to do as we move forward. Um, but there's not a tremendous amount of research and work to be done other than the knowledge I need to be willing. The knowledge that I need to have some patience and I need to not always be right and I need to not always be the center of attention because it's an ego smashing proposition. And when I find myself um, uh, becoming more ego centered, more ego driven, more wanting to win every argument, I know I'm going down the wrong path. That's how I look at myself today. So I hope you got something out of this video, and uh, hopefully I'll see you in steps eight and nine. Thank you.